We're coming up on Halloween, a time when people think about fear and death. And it's good to reflect on the fact that some things are worthy of fear. I know some psychotherapists who have asked why the Buddha didn't include fear among unskillful mind states. And that's because not all fear is unskillful. If your fear is combined with greed, aversion, and delusion, okay, then it's going to be unskillful. But there's also a wise fear. And the main wise fear is being afraid of the possibility of doing something unskillful. In other words, you don't have to be fear about fear about things outside or things that are going to happen to you. You have to be wary of what your mind is capable of doing. We're living in fairly normal circumstances right now, but things don't always stay peaceful like this. And the question comes up when things get difficult. Are you going to be able to maintain your conviction that you want to act skillfully, that you're not going to break the precepts, that you're going to be harmless in your behavior? That's something you have to be, be afraid of, being harmful. And the mind states that would make you act on the desire to be harmful. This is one of the reasons why we meditate, is to find something really solid inside that's not threatened by anything outside at all. Because it's usually through weakness that we tend to do unskillful things. So the mind needs to be strengthened. And there are five strengths that the Buddha talks about in this strength of conviction. In other words, being convinced that what you do is going to have long-term consequences. So you want to do it skillfully. Then there's persistence, putting energy into trying to do whatever is skillful and to abandon whatever is unskillful. Mindfulness, keeping in mind what is skillful and what's not, and keeping in mind the, the need to develop skillful things and abandon unskillful ones. And that leads to concentration. This is where you get the real strength of the nourishment. The Buddha compares concentration to food for the mind, the sense of well-being, the sense of rapture. It can come when the whole breath is filling the body, and the whole body is permeated by breath, and the breath flows smoothly. It's nourishing to all the parts of your body and mind. And it gives you a place where you can step back from other things and look at them and see what's really worthy of fear. This, of course, is discernment. Discernment and concentration are both nourishing for the mind, but in different ways. I think I've told you about the woman who was a student of John Furings who had advanced stages of cancer, and the cancer would seem to move around her body, and she was having an operation to have this part taken out or that part taken out. And this one time she was going to have to undergo radiation treatment, and she developed an allergy to the anesthetic. The doctors were in a quandary what to do. So she said, well, try just doing it without the anesthetic. And at first they didn't want to do it, but she said, look, I'm a meditator. I know how to handle pain. So they did. And she said, you know, she used all the force of her concentration to get through the experience. Then after it was over, she was exhausted. And John Furman went to visit her at the hospital. She told him what had happened. He said, the problem is that you're using your concentration, you're not using your discernment. In other words, you're trying to fight off things that if you learn how to sidestep them, you don't have to fight them off. When you lay claim to things in the body, claim to things in the mind, and then they get painful. Okay, you've set yourself up for a problem, but you learn how not to lay claim to these things. 
And when anything ha happens to them, okay, you're not threatened. That's a real strength. Because it reveals to you dimensions in the mind that you didn't realize you had before, the parts that are not affected by anything. You can sort things out this way by figuring out what's constant, what's inconstant, what's stressful, what's not stressful. What you have to let go of to see is not self, to find something that's beyond both self and not self. That's how discernment takes you beyond any danger or any fear. But it is all motivated by the realization okay, that the big dangers don't lie outside and they don't lie with other people. They lie within your own mind. So your mind is what has to be trained. Your mind is what has to be strengthened and made secure. This is why all the teachings focus in, in, in on what you're doing, what you're saying, what you're thinking. Because these, these are the areas where the dangers lie. As for the dangers of aging, illness, and death, the Buddha has you use them as motivation for practice. But he also wants to train you so that you don't have to be afraid of these things. They will happen. But if you develop the proper mental skill, you can experience them and not suffer. That's what the passage in the description of the five future dangers is all about. Realizing that aging, illness, death are going to come, social unrest is going to come. And you've got to develop the things in the mind to reach the as yet unreached, to the attain the as yet unattained, to realize the as yet unrealized. So that you will dwell in peace and comfort even when aging, illness, death, separation, social unrest come. So the Buddha's use of fear keeps pointing inward, inward. The problem lies in here, but also the solution lies in here as well. That's for fear of death. As he points out, there are four reasons why we're afraid of death. One, we're attached to our bodies. Two, we're attached to the pleasures of the human realm. Three, we realize that we've done some unskillful things, and there's that possibility always that there's going to be punishment after death for the unskillful things we've done. And four, there's the fact that you haven't yet reached the Dharma. In other words, you haven't yet reached stream entry, you haven't seen for sure that there is a part of the mind that doesn't die. So those are four things you have to work on. And again, there are four things you work on inside. By looking at your attachments to the body. Right now it's healthy, does pretty much what you want it to do. But as time passes, things are going to get less cooperative. And the body that keeps repairing itself over and over again without you even having to tell it to do, it stops being able to do that. The hormones change. It takes longer and longer to recover from excessive use of the different parts of the body. That's just basically a downhill slope. There are going to be a few ups here and there, but it's down most of the way. So you've got to reflect on that and realize okay, you can't stay attached here. Same with your sensual pleasures. All the things we like about it, sights, sight, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations. It's not the case that you're going to lose them at death. Sometimes you get so you can't see or you can't hear. Your taste buds get weird. All the senses start to start to decay. We're going to find happiness if, if you're dependent on those kinds of things for your happiness. All of this is incentive to find that dharma inside, the dharma of the deathless. 
which is a place of no danger, a place of no fear. So fear is something you want to learn how to use properly, something you want to understand. Which kinds of fears to develop, which kinds of fears to overcome. Realizing again that the dangers lie inside, but the place of safety lies inside as well. So keep your attention focused here. 